Giving God praise. It thrills my heart. Amen. And I hope it does yours as well. Let's me know that God's going to always take care of us. Amen. Amen. Take your Bibles. Turn with me to Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3 here in just a moment. We will start with verse 1. You know, we've all had times to where maybe something finally clicked. And what I mean by that is well, maybe we just realized something that we should have probably known an entire time of something. Uh, I mean, it could have been right there in front of us, but, but maybe or, or maybe there was something to where it was kind of like a mystery until someone else might have pointed it out for you. Um, it, it's kind of like if you watch a movie. And you don't pick up on everything, you know, type deal. You watch a movie, maybe some of you are talking about a movie and said, well, and it's kind of like in this part, you're like, what are you talking about? Maybe you didn't pick up on it. But then you go back later on, you watch the movie again, and you pick up on things that you might have missed the first time. I mean, you were watching just like everybody else, but yet some things just you, you forgot about or you overlooked it. And, and maybe you said, oh, my goodness, I've missed that detail. How did I miss that, right? Well, maybe it's kind of like some of these memes that are out there today that you see about something that you didn't realize was there for a certain purpose. Or maybe you learned something for the first time that you should have already known. For example, some of you have seen these memes out there now that says, I was today years old when I learned this. Y'all know what I'm talking about? Y'all seen this? What it means is I've learned something for the first time today. For an example, some of these. I was this day old when I learned that old saying, be there or be square, actually comes from the fact that you're not around. Seriously, that's what it means, that you're not around. So that's where it came from. Be there or be square came from the fact that you're not around. Maybe you just learned that today, okay? What about this one? <clears throat> I was today years old when I found out that Chuck E. Cheese's full name is actually Charles Entertainment Cheese. That's a new one. There you go. How about this one? I was today years old when I found out that the tags on the loaf of bread is based on the day it was baked. It was baked. For example, let me tell you. If there is a tan tag, you know that little, you know what I'm talking about, that little plastic tag that, that hangs right there? Yeah. Maybe you don't. Maybe I'm the only one. I was taking them and flip them or something. You know what I'm talking about? But listen. This is Monday. If it's tan, it means it was baked on Monday. If it was brown, that's Tuesday. If it's yellow, it's baked on Wednesday. Blue means Thursday. Green means Friday. Saturday is red. And Sunday is white. So tonight, when you go to Walmart and you look at those tags, you're going to see once again. Now, now, wait a minute. What day was blue? Right? That, that's what you're going to say, okay? But they have a meaning. Those tags and the color of those tags, once again, mean the day it was baked. How about this one? I was today years old. When I found out that the actual lyrics to Who Let the Dogs Out is actually who, 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 who. I've been barking this entire time. Okay, so it's not a bark, it's an actual who. Who, 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 who let the dogs out, okay? Maybe you're not as entertained about that as I am. I thought that was fascinating, okay? How about this one? I was today years old when I learned that flames don't have shadows. Ooh. Now, don't go home and set fire to your house because you're trying to check that out. But flames, if you hold a match up, light a flame or whatever, and hold it to the shadow, there will not be a shadow to a flame. Pretty interesting, okay? Let's close off with this one. And I already knew this one, but some of you may learn this. I was today years old when I realized that this little piggy went to the market doesn't mean he went food shopping. <laughs> okay? Just to let you know, okay? So in other words, friends, listen, some of these things may have shocked you, and some of them may have been like, that's a mystery to me. I, I didn't know that. And, and maybe they were a mystery until someone revealed it to you. Well, listen, in our passage of Scripture tonight, a mystery is going to be revealed in a sense that it should have been known. Through the Old Testament, once again, that he gave us clues and signs, but you know what? It wasn't known. But Paul gives its clarity in this text. And so from this point forward now, even up to us today, listen, it's no mystery. Out of honor and reverence to read God's word, if you're technically able, please stand with me. Ephesians chapter 3, start with verse 1. For this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, 
If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly, briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God, who created all things through Jesus Christ, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers of the heavenly, in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for your word tonight. God, I thank you for the Apostle Paul writing down what you told him to write down. And Lord, I thank you that the mystery has been revealed, that we are your children through Christ Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for loving us the way that you do, providing the way through Jesus Christ, your Son, by dying on that cross. Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much. But Father, I pray that tonight we see some aspects about this, this mystery that was known up until this point in time. And Father, I pray that we leave here tonight once again known a little bit more than when we came in here today, Lord. Father, may we praise you and we give this time to you right now. And Lord, I ask if there is someone in here tonight that does not know you as Lord and Savior, Father, use this time. Speak your word. Speak the truth. Let them have the understanding from your spirit, Lord, and draw them in. May they be forever saved, Lord. And so, Father, I pray for this time. Use this. Encourage the saints as well. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Here in our text, it's interesting because Paul actually begins with a prayer for the believers to understand the resources that they have now that they are one in Christ. And then he actually decides to re-emphasize and expand some of the truths that he's already mentioned so far. And what's funny is, friends, is that he actually, he does not actually get into the prayer until verse 14. He starts his prayer right here, but he doesn't even get into his prayer. We're not going to see that until next week. But he, he then repeats the phrase in verse 14 for this reason, the same thing that he said in verse 1, but he picks up in order that that thought that he originally introduced in verse 1. That's why he did that. And, and maybe the reason why he did that was perhaps maybe he felt like uh, they were not ready to hear his prayer on their behalf until they completely understood what he was praying for them. Maybe that is the case. I don't really know. But, but maybe he, it was because he wanted them to better apply the truths that he wanted to pray about. I don't know. But once again, we know that he pauses from the prayer. It's like he starts off praying, and he's like, well, wait a minute. Let me explain, Let me explain to you some things. And so that's what he does right here in verses 2 down to verse 13. Okay, so I want you to know that. But friends, his primary emphasis is on the great mystery now revealed by God, listen, that both Gentiles and Jews are one in Christ and that there is no longer any distinction. They have been taught differently their entire life up until this point. And Paul is reminding them. And ultimately, friends, the entire theme of this section is really found in verse 6. Look at verse 6 again. That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. But throughout this section, friends, Paul leads us to focus on five aspects of this divine mystery. Okay? First of all, friends, he brings attention to the privilege of knowing the mystery. He brings focus on the privilege of knowing the mystery. Listen to verse 1 through 4 again. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. 
Paul begins by actually introducing the cause of his prayer by saying this, for this reason. And he refers back to the group of truths that he's just discussed. He's already covered these things that he is speaking here throughout these 13 verses. He's already covered them back in chapter 2. He actually now he goes back and he gives them more detail because he wants to make sure that they understand what he's talking about. And so he goes back and he gives more detail. For example, I remind you that he told them that all believers are one body in Christ. He already told them back in chapter 2, verse 16. Not only that, but he already told them that the Gentiles, who once were far off, now has come near since they believe in verse 17 of chapter 2. He told them that all believers are equally citizens of God's kingdom, and therefore they are members of his family back in verse 19. He told them that all believers are being built into God's temple and his dwelling place in verse 21 and 22. So once again, he's told them these things, but let me ask you this. Have you ever had been told twice about something? Absolutely. And so Paul is telling them, he's reiterating what he has already said. So Paul decides to go over again some of these truths, letting them know something, friends, that it's really not too good to be true. He's telling them this. It's not too good to be true. Friends, let's just be honest. Sometimes God's truth sounds too good to be true. It really does. I, I mean, think about it, especially if you're looking from the outside in. And what I mean by that is, you see, for the unbelievers, church, just, just think about this if you can. Try to remember back when you were an unbeliever. It is hard to believe that all of my sins can be forgiven. That I can have an eternity in heaven. That I get to enjoy the riches of God's kingdom. That I get to be co-heirs with Jesus. And all I got to do is believe and live for him. What? Really, you mean everything that I have done in life, that I've sinned against God, you're telling me that, that by recognizing what he did for me on the cross, and those things are already paid for? You're telling me that? That's exactly what I'm telling you. You're telling me that, that when Moses and the Israelites were in the desert and the serpents came up, which by the way, remember I told you that would have been the worst, that would have been the worst plague of all in my life. When the serpents, when the serpents came into the campground, remember that? And started biting people? You remember God told Moses to build that bronze serpent and lift it up, and all the people have to do is look at it. And they'll be healed. And they'll live. But what's funny is there were still some people that didn't look at it. And they died. Thousands of them did. Why? Because it was too good to be true. Maybe the mentality is I've got to do something. I, I've got to do something to earn this. Or maybe there's something I've got to work towards, right? Those Israelites may have thought, well, no, no, no. I've got to make a, I gotta make a anti-venom. I've got to make a vaccine. I, I've got to do this. I've got to do this. And God said, no, you just look at that pole. Listen, friends, you want your sins forgiven? Just look at the pole. Look at the cross. It sounds too good to be true, doesn't it? But it's true. It's true. And, and that's what Paul is saying right here. But, but Paul starts off by reminding them of the privilege of hearing and understanding what he taught them. He starts off by drawing attention to his divine teaching. Now, now saying what he does in verse 2. Look, at, look back in verse 2. If indeed you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God, which was given to me. Notice the last two words. For you. It was given to me, but it's for you. You see, listen, friends. What he's basically saying, he's saying, as I'm sure you've already heard... <laughs> And what they have already heard was the stewardship of God's grace, which was given to Paul on behalf of the belief of the Gentiles. Paul, you go tell them. Paul was God's man to share the word to the Gentiles. You go tell them. Paul was appointed a steward by God's grace, and then he became a steward of God's grace. Think about that. You see, and friends, this is true for each of us. Church, every believer is a steward of the calling, 
We are a steward of our spiritual gifts. We are a steward of our opportunities, our skills, our knowledge, and every other blessing that we have received from the Lord. We are a steward of those things. So what have you done? What have you done? Church, we are therefore trusted stewards to manage our lives and everything that we possess in behalf of the one to whom they belong. So Paul's stewardship right here, friends, Paul's stewardship was to pass on what he had been given to the Gentiles. That's what he had been called to do. Now, obviously, friends, listen, the mystery is that of Jew and Gentile now being one in Christ. Now being one. Up until this point in time, it was unknowable. It was incomprehensible truth hidden from all men until it was revealed by God. Now, once again, we, we've seen pictures of the Old Testament of it and, and God telling what was coming, but they didn't understand. Not until we got to the New Testament, and I'll get to that here in just a moment. But Paul was instrumental in revealing these mysteries to the people. Paul was saying, hey, those things that you heard about in the Old Testament, now let me explain to you what they mean. He was sharing that with the church. It is our privilege. Listen to me. It is our privilege of letting this world know that they can be children of God through faith in Christ Jesus as well. We have been given a great privilege of knowing and now letting the mystery be known. Just like Paul, we've been given the privilege of passing it on. It's up to us. But secondly, friends, we see the plan of the mystery. We we'll see the plan of the mystery. This is number five and six, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as it has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. I went ahead and read verse seven there, but let's focus on verse five and six. You see, in past generations, friends, this mystery was not made known to the sons of men. They didn't know it for sure. Now, the sons of men refers to mankind in general. It does not just mean God's chosen people, Israel. It doesn't mean just them. No, you see, before the church age, though, no person, not even the greatest of God's prophets, they had anything but a glimpse of the truth that Paul is now disclosing. You see, the Old Testament teachings that relate to this mystery... It can now only be understood clearly in light of the New Testament revelation. They knew it, they heard it, but they didn't fully understand it. They didn't understand what, what it was talking about, what God had revealed to them. But in other words, friends, listen, we can now understand many of the Old Testament prophecies because of what has been revealed to us through the Holy Spirit. We can now look back on the Old Testament when, when, when even the Pharisees and scribes, sure, they may have known the law, but they didn't have full understanding of it. Why? Because it wasn't fulfilled until Christ. It wasn't fulfilled until the New Testament. It wasn't fulfilled until the writings of the epistles. It wasn't fulfilled until them. But now we have both, and we have the complete picture. And so through the understanding of the Holy Spirit, we can look back and understand the full meaning of it. But friends... They had a difficult time. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament saints, listen, they, they didn't fully understand. Matter of fact, they, no one actually knew the full meaning of God's promise even to Abraham. Listen to what God told Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, when he said, In you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Now up until this point in time, they thought it was just them. But that promise included us. And you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. That included the Gentiles back then, but they didn't understand that. You see, they didn't understand it until Paul wrote Galatians chapter 3, verse 8. that says this, in the scripture, for saying that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand, saying, in you, all the nations shall be blessed. So Paul explained to them, hey, Remember what that was promised way back a couple thousand years ago to our father Abraham? He was talking about you. Isn't that good? He said, hey, 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 Gentiles, you were a part of the promise a long time ago. That was, that was the plan. Old Testament saints, they, think about this, friends. They didn't have a vision of the church. 
They didn't have a vision of the church. The clues that they had in the Old Testament were only a mystery to them because too much information was lacking at the time. That is why Jews in the early church had such a difficult time accepting the Gentile believers as, as being completely on the same spiritual level as the Jews. They couldn't wrap their mind around that. But, as Paul actually writes in verse 5, notice what he says. It has now been revealed by the Spirit to his holy apostles and prophets. It's now been revealed. We now understand it. And friends, listen to me. That one phrase right there, has now been revealed, is in the aorist tense, which refers to specific acts or events. In other words, he is saying, it here indicates that present revelation that was given directly to him for them. That's what he is saying right here. And so, friends, to be specific, Paul actually goes on and he says in verse 6, listen to this, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. You know, I want you to think about this, friends. It, it, really, it is difficult for us to realize how incredibly revolutionary this truth had to be for the Jews in that day. I, I want you to think about this. You see, in spite of the fact that the Old Testament did teach that Gentiles would be blessed by God, it taught that in multiple places. The idea of including the Gentiles, the idea of including them in the body with the Jews, was mind-blowing for them. No, this, this can't be. <laughs> We're the chosen people. This can't be that they're allowed to come in with us. Yet then Paul steps up the ante right here. He ups the ante. But listen when he says, Paul declares that not only, once again, are, are, are they there and they would be blessed, they'd be a part of them, but yet he declares that they also would be fellow heirs. That's what it says right there. Think about this, friends. The ones that were excluded now have legal status before God as his own chosen people, just like the Jews were. <laughs> but guess what? It gets better. Because then he doesn't stop there. Not only are they fellow heirs, but he goes on and says that we are fellow members of the body. Which means this. We also have the same benefits that the Jews had. The same benefits. We are part of the same body. Church, you know what this meant to them back then? This meant that they were no longer second-class citizens. This meant that they were not to look down on anyone else. See, the Jews, they, they considered themselves up here, and the Gentiles were way down here. But God brought them up here. That's what he did. And they're on level playing ground. Once again, Gentiles are no longer distant relatives. Church, we are fellow members of the body of Christ. And Paul then goes on and shares that because that is the case, he then says this, that we are also partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. Oh, church, do you realize what this means? Not only for them back then, but, but realize what it means for us today. Think about this. Regardless of who we were before we were saved, we are now partakers of everything that pertains to Christ. We are partakers of it all. And church, here's my point. This was his plan the entire time. This was the plan. That it was for everyone. That everyone was to be involved. The Jews and the Gentiles. That Christ came for the entire world. He leveled the playing field. The mystery that was known in the Old Testament that they didn't get it. What does it mean by this? I hear what he's saying, but it doesn't mean. Now Paul's saying, here's what it means. Because of Christ, you're just as good as they are. You get everything they do. Hey, welcome to the family. That's what he's saying right there. And, and man, you just think about what that meant for them and what it means for us. And that was the plan. But thirdly, friends, then thirdly we see the position of preaching the mystery. The position of preaching the mystery. Listen to verse 7 through 9. 
of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power. To me, who am less than the least of all the saints, this grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ, and to make all see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the ages has been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ. Paul reminds us of the gospel is spread by men whom God calls to proclaim it. And friends, it is the gospel of which he was made a minister. Now friends, the word minister is the same word that we also get the word deacon. The word minister is diakonos. Now wait a minute, deacons aren't ministers, some of them are. But it's the exact same word. The basic meaning of which is this, a servant. A servant. Paul's single responsibility was to be a faithful servant. And according to the gift of the grace that was given to him by God through God's power, he was to share the message that he wanted him to share. That was the purpose. Friends, something that we need to understand and something that we need to be reminded of is that the Lord is the power behind the servant. Did you hear what I just said? The Lord is the power behind the servant. And Paul acknowledged in verse 8, notice what he says, that he's less than all the saints. Notice what he says right here, to me, who am less than the least of all the saints. In other words, I'm the lowest of the lows. That's what he said of himself. I'm the least, I'm who am less than the least of all the saints. Listen this. This grace was given that I should preach among the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ. In other words, listen, friends, he realized that even though he was less than all the saints, but it was by God's grace that that gave him the ability to preach to the Gentiles. It was by God's grace. Church, may we all remain with a spirit of humility as we remember that it is through God's power that he has called us to preach the great mystery of Jesus Christ. It's through his power. You don't have to go in your own power. You don't have to go in your own strength. It's his power. He gives you what you need. And church, listen, because of that, we shouldn't have the big head about it. We shouldn't be able to puff out our chest about it. No, friends, when we realize that it's his power, that it's by his grace that we're able to do what we do, listen, friends, it should humble us all the more. It should humble us all the more. But saying that, friends, next we see the purpose of the mystery. We see the purpose of the mystery. Listen to verse 10 and 11. To the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, everything that God has ever done has had the ultimate purpose of giving himself glory. But wait a minute, I, I thought that it was because he loved us. He does. And he wants us to have eternal life. So that in turn, what will we do? Give God glory. So that we'll give up. Well, now wait a minute, Brother Kyle, that's selfish. Well, let me tell you something, friends. If anyone ever had the right to be selfish, it's God. There is none higher. He deserves all praise and honor and glory. And that's what he is saying right here. Now, friends, let me also make something else very clear. The church does not exist simply for the purpose of saving souls. What? You heard me. I'm going to say that again. The church does not simply exist for the purpose of saving souls. Though that is a marvelous and important work. But listen, the supreme purpose of the church, as Paul makes explicit right here, is to glorify God by manifesting His wisdom so that others can therefore, under, therefore understand and that way they can in turn come to know Christ so that they can in turn give God praise. That's the purpose. We are to edify and strengthen one another so that as we go out, then we can then lead others. And once we lead others, then they can come and be strengthened and be edified. And then they can go out and lead others. Why? To give God 
praise. To glorify God. Listen, the purpose of the entire universe is to give God glory. That's it. That's the entire purpose. Church, listen, the church in, in itself, that's not, that's not about us. No, you see, the church is not an end in itself, but a means to an end. And the end is glorifying God. That's what it's all about. That's our entire purpose. The glory of God is the supreme goal of all creation. That's what it is. But finally, friends, finally we see the power of the mystery. Listen to the last two verses here. Listen to verse 12 and 13. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith in Him. Therefore I ask that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. You know, when we put our faith, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we can freely come to God. And the Bible says that we get to share in all the unfathomable riches. I want you to think about that for a moment. Look at verse 12 again. In whom we have boldness, this, and, this, and access with confidence. Underline that in your Bibles. Think about that. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence. Church, we can freely come to God with confidence anytime we want because of Jesus Christ. Think about the power behind this. Because in Judaism, listen, only the high priest could enter into the presence of God in the Holy of Holies. And that was but briefly only once a year on the Day of Atonement. That was it. That was the only time that they could do it. But now, friends, what Paul says right here is that whoever comes to Christ in faith can come before God at any time with boldness and access Him with confidence. Church, that means that we can crawl up in the lap of our Father anytime we want to. We can approach Him anytime we want to, having that confidence that knowing that we are saved and having that confidence and knowing that He's going to hear. Why? Because of what Jesus Christ has done. That's the reason why. I have confidence of knowing that He hears my prayers. I have confidence of knowing that He is with me and He will never leave me. I have confidence in these things. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. I have confidence. And that's what he's saying. There's power with his church. The power is in Christ. Notice what it says right there. Through faith in him. So it says. That's where the power is. Through faith in him. And knowing this, friends, Paul actually concludes by saying this in verse 13. Therefore I ask, I love this, that you do not lose heart at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Church, when tribulations come your way, don't lose heart. When tribulations come your way, don't lose heart. One day, listen to me, friends, we won't have to deal with this garbage anymore. <laughs> One day we're not going to have to deal with it anymore because we've got something better coming because we are now, as Paul says right here, as Gentiles, we are now a part of the family of God because of His work and because of His grace. Church, something better is coming. But it's not because of what you've done. It's all because of what He's done. So don't lose heart. No. You know what? Get excited about it. When tribulations come, it's only for a little while. It's only for a little while. And then eternity comes. Eternity comes. Church, it's not a mystery. He wants all of us to come to Him. And if you're here tonight, and you feel this drawing, you're like, Boy, God, I, I want to be a part of this. I, I'm now understanding this mystery. The Holy Spirit has, has explained this to me through Paul. I feel him drawing me right now. Then come, you'll be. Why don't you come? It's not a mystery that he wants all to come. Like I said, if that's you, you accept him. Come to the cross. Come to the cross. Church, listen. It's no longer a mystery 
what he has done. So give him praise for it. If that's you, you need to come. Maybe you just need to come to this altar tonight and say, Lord, thank you for revealing this mystery. To where now we understand that we have access to you. And we can come to you with confidence anytime we want to. And Lord, I'm sorry for taking that for granted. So here I am tonight, and I've got things in my heart that I need to get right with you. If that's you, then friends, I pray.